Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital heart, uh, startup hub. We have a great founder tonight, Nell Goldstein. Al is representative of a really exciting uh, trend we're seeing in Chicago, uh, which is uh, founders who are successful who go and do it again. Um, incredible story to share with you tonight. And since we last met, some of, some of you have seen uh, founders like Godard Abel and others who've continued to start new companies and do things. And I think that is a real exciting uh, sign of the maturing startup scene here in Chicago. But uh, join me in welcoming Al. We're really lucky to have you here tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. So um, we'll cover a lot. Al's founded three significant uh, companies. Uh, and uh, has some great stories and some great experiences. I always learn a lot from this. I also learn a lot from just getting together and have a, have a breakfast with Al and talk about what he's done. But let's start with, let's go back in time, because you're not originally from Chicago. Um, you're actually nope. uh, from a long way from Chicago originally. Um, talk about where you were born and, and, and um, the early years of your life and, and growing up. Sure. By the way, thank you for having me, and I get to be amongst friends. The beauty of Chicago is that there are a lot of friends in the audience, and we stack the deck with Avant people, so hopefully <laughs> awesome. know, they'll, they'll applaud to my, my you know, stupid jokes, and, and they'll be good, uh, good, uh, good viewers. So, yes, yeah, so I was born in the former Soviet Union, and my family uh, immigrated to the north suburbs of Chicago in the late 80s, and I've been in Chicago pretty much ever since. And so you were from Uzbekistan? From Uzbekistan. And how old were you when you moved to Chicago? Area? So I was eight years old. My wife, who actually happens to be here, is from St. Petersburg. She doesn't deem Uzbekistan to be a proper place to grow up. So <laughs> she thinks that uh, St. Petersburg is a more sophisticated you know, experience in the former Soviet Union. Well, we, I'm not touching that one, so we'll go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you move here, and um, you know, you've, you've clearly been, even at a very young, fairly young age as an uh, adult, a very prolific entrepreneur. Um, you know, what was your interest? Did you have an interest in technology as a kid? Were you interested in entrepreneurial things? What, what were the things if someone grew up next door to you or, or as a classmate, they'd say, oh, yeah, I can see, I can see how Al had some of that. What were, the, what were you like? So, so interesting, my older brother, uh, who was five and a half years older, was actually my co-founder in my first two companies. And he's a world-class software engineer, spent seven and a half years out in the valley working for Siebel Systems, now has his own company. He's the technologist in the family, and he had... When we came to, to the U.S., we had no money. He was the one convincing my parents to buy that, you know, Commodore 64, that, and he was writing code, and I was out playing football with my friends. And uh, I think what probably my parents would say is the fact that I couldn't hold a job down <laughs> for longer than a month uh, until college, where the only job I was able to hold was a job at a bar, that, that maybe that was a precursor to future entrepreneurship. Yeah, so you were an athlete. You played sports a lot in high school. Um, yeah. You, uh, you know, it's not, it's not exactly what people would assume losing technology. So, so what happened along the way? You, you, know, you go to college, and what did you major in again? Uh, finance and math. Okay, so finance and math. And weren't you, I think at one point you said to me you were a little bored with math. Well, no, I, my math professors would make fun of me because I'd be the only finance kid in those math classes. But to me, in retrospect, I wish I did more math and computer science, maybe a little less finance, mm -hmm. just given where the world is going. So what drew you to finance? What was it? Do you want to be a business person? What was, your, what was the allure? Yeah, I didn't really know. My brother was older than me and had graduated. We went to Siebel Systems in 1997, rode the first tech bubble up. And I was sitting in college, and I felt like I needed to do something to just keep up with the uh, Russian Jewish family, where the bar is very, very high. And um, finance to me at the time seemed to be the place to go. And I didn't know what investment banking was. I didn't know what hedge funds really were. But that seemed to be the industry that was exploding. Right. So you, it is the in the '90s were a time where that was happening. You so you went to one of the great ones. You went to Deutsche Bank uh, as an investment banker, uh, New York. Yeah. I, I, so I actually got hired in Chicago, and then, you know, investment banking is an up and down sector. So my job got relocated the day before I started to New York. <laughs> so, talk a little bit about what drew you to that. What did you take away from that? How long did you spend as an investment banker? Yeah. So I. I really didn't know what I wanted to do growing up. I thought I was going to follow a more traditional path, which is a couple years of investment banking, maybe a couple years of private equity or hedge fund, maybe get an MBA. And uh, I think just the allure of Wall Street was exciting, and Boiler Room, and all these different things that we watched on TV. And So I loved investment banking for the 14 minutes or so that I did it. <laughs> uh, 
in, in truth, it was about 14 months. And I was in New York. I was in the heart of it all at Deutsche Bank, working 100 hours a week. Okay. But what I was what years were this? This was uh, 02, 03. Okay, so it was after the bubble had burst, but after, it was still exciting. After the bubble has burst, but I was working in leverage finance, which mm -hmm. was for Deutsche Bank. They were the preeminent bank in that, which is basically uh, high-yield bonds and bank financing for companies. And it was on fire. All we did is work on live deals, which in investment banking is what you want to do. And I was learning so much for the first six months. And then very quickly, it became a process environment where you would spend your time marking up a presentation. You give it to your boss who marks it up, gives it back to you, you do it, and you kind of do that for a long time until about 3 in the morning. And then you come back at 9 in the morning and do it again. So it just, I think the learning experience plateaued very quickly. Well, good news is working in an investment bank, you work entrepreneur hours, so you already know how to run at that pace. No, when I, when I left was because one of my uh, mentors and a guy I had interned for uh, at a trading company when I was younger told me that, why don't you come and take a 90% uh, pay cut to work only 80 hours a week instead of 100? <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, yeah, it was a great sales pitch. So, you're, so here you are, um, you're working at a bank, you're making a lot of money for a young guy. You're working hard hours, but it's exciting. It's going on. And, um, you know, the most common move isn't in 2002, 3, 4 to go become an entrepreneur. If anything, that's what we talked about at Tech Entrepreneurship was nuclear winter. So you clearly had your own uh, true north that was calling you. Talk about the decision to leave banking, not just leave banking, um, but what was it that drew you to starting a, a company? And, and talk about the genesis of that. Yeah, so I always wanted to do something on my own. I think I, I joke about it. I didn't do it when I was in high school or college necessarily, but I think one of the reasons I had a hard time holding down a job is just problems with authority, which in my experience is common uh, amongst entrepreneurs. And because you always think that you're right, and being subservient to somebody else's authority is, is a difficult you know, situation to be in. And so I had an amazing opportunity because David Shore, who's my original co-founder, he, uh, he was a mentor of mine, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I was actually buying real estate on the side where he was going to be my investor. He was the one that said, let's just do something together. And uh, at the time, all he said was, I have a million dollars of my own capital. I'm willing to commit to an idea. I don't really know what the idea is yet, but for me at the time, a million dollars was like, oh, my God, it's the largest amount of money I could possibly imagine. With a million dollars, we could build anything. And the downside was pretty simple. I would end up in business school, which, which is where I was going to end up anyway. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of tried to come up with an idea that made sense. So how'd you come up? The idea became Innova. The idea became Innova. So we'll talk about Innova in a minute. But where did the idea come from? Talk about the genesis of the idea. So we actually didn't start as a technology company. We started as a brick and mortar financial services center based in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, and so I left investment banking to go and drive up to Kenosha every morning at 7 in the morning and come home at 9 p.m. at night. So my hours didn't change that much from investment banking. But the idea was pretty simple. The savings and loans had left the sphere uh, through the savings and loan crisis. And banks started to really pull back from providing small dollar credit to consumers. And so there was this massive hole that was forming. And, and how did you see that? I mean, it's, it makes a lot of sense, but what, what gave you the... What, How'd you, how'd you see that opportunity? Because there's a lot going on. So originally, we were looking at different ideas. And Dave, who's my co-founder, had a friend of a friend that had these financial service centers in Arizona that were doing well. And so we just started looking at the category. And uh, we did a whole bunch of research, built a business plan. So the original business, if I were reading the original business plan right here, what would it have said to me? What would it have told us? It was Innova, but in the brick and mortar setting. So we would open locations. Like a Roll out or roll out of these sorts of things? Yeah, we would open up 200 locations over the next five to 10 years that would provide the services that Enova provides, which is credit to small dollar, you know, small dollar. So it's power. interesting. A lot of people may not remember this, but in the 90s, starting with Blockbuster in the late 80s, there was, which is funny to think of Blockbuster as being this hot, innovative company, but yeah. um, there was, they were rolling out these, form, they called the formula uh, rollouts. Yeah. And so you'd find a, a concept, and you'd figure out how to make the, you know, what they call the four, you know, cookie four cutter wall, and yeah, yeah, the four wall key. economics work. Get it work. Get the get the get the machine working right, the model right, and then you'd scale it. That this was, was this was the dot coms before the dot coms. Yeah, some of them worked really well, like Blockbuster did for a long period of time. 
others of them like Boston Chicken and you know were sort of had a moment and then and then hit. But this was for entrepreneurs. This was the really exciting place to be. Formula rollouts were it before the internet. That was exactly our strategy. We would do one location, figure out the economics, figure out the strategy, the turnkey setup, do a second location, and then try to do 20. So you get up there. So you go from the glamorous, you know, uh, halls of Wall Street where you're paid a lot of money and, you know, you, uh, the, you're living in a, a, a very, um, you know, there's the famous cookies at 9 o'clock at night, all the stuff that the banks have for you to kind of keep you happy and well-fed, to going to basically a uh, subprime financing in place in Kenosha. What was the experience like when you became an entrepreneur? It doesn't sound like it was glamorous, and obviously a lot of hard work to learn it. Share what it was like going from you know uh, Deutsche Bank to Kenosha, and, and what was that experience like? And, and just give us a little flavor for it. Yeah, it was it was a culture shock uh, for sure because I'd never really, you know, I worked in retail when I was younger, but I never really understood retail. I didn't realize what it takes to manage significant amounts of cash in a retail setting where you really have to trust. And when you don't have any people to trust, you have to do it all yourself. So I opened and closed the, the, the first store seven days a week for three months. And this was 7.30 in the morning till 8.30 at night hours up in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was a... Uh, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's the first realization I had that being an entrepreneur is substantially more challenging than being an employee just because you can never sleep, you can never give it up. So you're there and you're in Kenosha. It's Saturday night. Your friends are out drinking beers in Chicago. Your friends in New York are, you know, there's a big thing back in the day where if they had any, you know, they would use the limos sometimes yep. to go yeah, limo, limo races and go to bars and all this. They're calling you and being like, hey, we're, we're out and, you know, um, we're out on the Upper West Side, and you're there in Kenosha doing this. Did you ever think to yourself, what am I doing? Oh, all the time. The, be the best was the first time I went back to New York, and we would go to Little Italy when I lived in New York, and we went back there. I'm like, man, I just can't afford this anymore. <laughs> no, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was definitely one of those rude awakenings where you have to commit. It's like, do I really want to do this, or do I want to go and work in investment banking or private equity? So were you able to make the model work? Did you feel like you had the model down? So the first location, and, and this was heart and soul. By the way, just, just to be clear, in formula rollouts, getting the model right was the equivalent of product market fit in technology. So this 100%. is like the product market fit question we cover every time to a, to a physical location. 100%. So that's why we wanted to do one, and we wanted to make sure we did it right. And so Talk, the so what, what did you think going into it, and what did you learn was different than that? Talk about finding product market fit in one location. Well, I think... I remember, I remember an interesting story. So we opened January 8th of 2004. So I quit banking October of 2003. We opened, we opened in January in our first location. It was just my, me and my partner there. And we had a soft opening. And all of a sudden, a bunch of people actually just showed up and lined up. And we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to provide credit. We didn't know what the underwriting was. We were just so excited that people showed up. So we gave everybody a loan. I think... <laughs> I'm very certain 100% of those loans defaulted immediately. <laughs> so it was, it was, a, it was, it was uh, just the fact that we got it open, we got the lease, got the build out. I spent way too much time thinking about the right legal structure because that was my background. And in retrospect, I probably should have spent a lot more time thinking about how to make loans. But fairly quickly, we figured out the product market fit. The first store became profitable within a two or three month span. What was the non-intuitive insight that really helped you figure that out? Like something you didn't know, you know, talking about it on the business plan, but when you're on the ground, you're like. And I would say credit. The realization that in the lending business, it's all about data and analytics and how you actually underwrite consumers. Because at the time we kept thinking, it was like, okay, are people going to come and can we provide them credit? We forgot the part about how do you actually figure out who to lend to and who not to. So was it easier to get applicants than you expected? Initially, yes. But again, none of those applicants paid. Right. It was much more challenging to figure out who was a good credit and who was a bad credit. And in the absence of that analytics and capability, you can't provide good rates to the better quality consumers. So how'd you solve for that? So we spent a lot of time, and I spent a lot of time personally just, just looking at data and analytics and looking at correlations, going back to my math background, which I didn't think was that useful at the time, and building really basic regression models 
to try to figure out, okay, who in fact is going to be likely to pay, who is not going to be likely to pay. How do you so where did the data come from? Was it just your store or were you able to get some other, other data? So initially it was just the store data. It was really basic. And uh, even when we ended up migrating online, which I know is, is coming up, we went back to the store data yeah. as the basis for our first what model. Was the, that we what did. was the radius like? Are those stores, you know, they, are they hyper local or are they more broad? They're pretty local and the challenge in that business is, is you know, you point out a blockbuster Hollywood video, there was a war for locations. and all the big companies, some of which had gone public, were just fighting for the best location. In retail, it's all location, location, location. It's interesting. Um, you know, I've always heard as you get into some subprime credits, actually proximity helps in terms of assessing credit and being able to follow up things. But so you got, you're, you're working on, you figure out this model, you, you, you understand how, how regressions fit into this, you start to really get it, you get the product market fit, you get your first location going, your plan was to do 200 of them, but you zagged instead of zigged. What, 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 what made you go to the internet then? Because the internet wasn't new. Internet was not new. Internet in this category was relatively new. Right. But so. But when you did your business plan. We, it was not a core part of our business. We yeah, believed so. that having a website that would drive people into the store was the key. So what, what caused you to make that shift? Because that was a big shift that changed the ball game. For sure. So we actually opened a second location in Racine, Wisconsin, which was even further from where I was living at the time, which was at my parents because you know I couldn't afford anything. And uh, because the first location was doing pretty well, so we opened the second location. And at the time, we had a website, which was a really basic website. My brother, who was you know the tech wizard, helped me put it together. It was really, really basic. But we started to get applications via the web, hmm. and people would come into the store and ask us the questions like. Why can't I just apply online? Why do I have to come into oh, the store? Interesting. And we would start to get more applications online just from really basic marketing, putting the website onto the marketing we were doing, onto a billboard. We fairly quickly realized that there was potential in just eliminating the brick and mortar and going online. But really, really interesting. You know, Max Levchin, who also grew up in the former Soviet Union Ukraine, yeah. um, tells a story at PayPal how they, PayPal was originally, people know the story of what PayPal's original idea was, we will beam money to each other on our Palm Pilots, so we'll go out to dinner and we'll beam, you know, we'll split the check, I'll pay, and we'll beam each other, you'll beam me your half the check. That didn't take off. I'm, I'm sure all of you with Palm Pilots are surprised by that, you can't use PayPal right now on that. But, uh, um, but what they did was, which was fascinating, is he had a website up just as another way because you know you had the you had the mobile website and you had the website, and um, this is you know much earlier. This is early internet and uh, commercial like, consumer internet. And Max used to get annoyed because people were using the website, and he'd get all annoyed. He's like, "We don't want the damn website. We want them on on you know, a Palm Pilots." And he thought about shutting it down. He's like, "We should just shut this thing down. It's noise. It's distracting. These consumers need to go to Palm Pilots." And then, to his credit, being the empiricist he is, he basically said, we should see what they're using it for. And he looked and he realized, oh, these are eBay sellers who are trying to figure out how they get paid. Maybe we'll look a little more. This thing took off. Had they never built that website, PayPal never would have been anything because the Palm Pilot idea went down in flames. But this secondary thing they had that was peripheral at best became the, the same vision, totally different channel, and took off, and so it's interesting to see the parallels um, of how that happens because obviously PayPal became a 1.5 billion dollar company today, just spun out this week, I think, or last week, yeah. uh, for 48 billion dollars, and it's incredible what they've done. But had they not had that sort of peripheral website, it never would have taken off. Yeah, and Max is back in the fintech world with a company called The Firm. Yeah. Yeah, which, uh, which you know, and I, I agree. I think it makes total sense to to me. The core was, there was a fundamental gap in the market. We just didn't quite know exactly what the right answer was to how to solve it. Right. So you start seeing those, and so at what point do you and your co-founder sit down and say to yourselves, and your investors say, all right, we're, time, time to rip up the business plan, because that's a bold thing. Yeah. You get very committed in your mind to like, you start telling people, we're gonna do 200 of these things. When people say, why are you never go out? What are you doing? You say, well, I'm, I'm building this chain, right? Remember, formula rollouts were cool back then. The internet was totally out because everybody said this whole internet thing was a fad. 
these businesses aren't going to work. It sounds ludicrous today, but in 2004, that was not the cool thing to say. And so here you've got this plan. You're committed to it, at least publicly, and you completely shift gears. How's well, that happen? So it happened quickly, but not, not uh, in a straight line. You know, it, it was more of that zigzag that you talk about. So we opened January of 2014 our first store. We opened uh, June of 2014 our second store. We launched online in June of 14. Hmm. So we, we at the time, uh, my brother was still at Siebel Systems out in the valley. We convinced him to join the cause because I didn't know anything about technology at the time. And he took a leave of absence. He didn't trust me enough to actually quit, so he took a leave. <laughs> It, we still we still joke about it. So so he took a leave of absence of six months to figure out if this was going to work, and uh, we set up a little office in Lake Bluff. So now we were Lake Bluff, Kenosha, and Racine, Wisconsin, and I started very quickly spending a lot more of my time online, and the stores did okay, but it was clear to me that the online business was the way that we were going to scale and beat the brick and mortar companies that were better at location, had more money had more scale and probably a better formula. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you, you make the move to the internet and what, um, you know, what kind of challenges do you meet in making that transition and what are the headwinds, what are the tailwinds that you find? Well, for one, raising capital in subprime consumer lending in 2004 with no tech background and I'm pretty sure you couldn't fill a room like this Maybe, maybe, maybe like to the second row we could fill. Yeah. Uh, With friends and family. Yeah, exactly. Including. And uh, nobody cared. Right. And I didn't know anything about venture capital, so the first challenge was just raising money. And uh, because my co-founder had been successful, had capital, used his network, and was willing to put a significant amount of his own capital in the business, we were able to raise $1.8 million for 50% of the business. Right? You could do the math on that pre-money. It was uh, you know, not something that people would get overly excited about today. Um, so you, you get the money, you go, you grow. This, but your time to know was fairly quick. Yeah, so Innova officially launched June of 2014. and it 2004. Just, June of 2004, yes. Freud, Freudian. Freudian. Um, but it went pretty quick because the market opportunity was massive, and we had a simple premise. We wanted to be the white hat operator provide a product that was clean, transparent, empowered the consumer, and nobody else really was doing that. And then we got product market fit. We started to figure out what that actually meant, and so we got customer adoption. And you know, the business kind of went like this. Our biggest challenge was making sure we could actually find the capital to fund it. So who, who'd you raise the money from? It was all friends and family, yeah. There so really was no angel community at that time that I knew of. And so total, you raised about three million? About three million of equity, yeah. And, um, when you sold, you sold, what, 2006? Yeah, we sold in September of 2006, and there was a long tail, uh, which lasted until September of 2008. Um, and can you say what you sold for? Yeah, it's actually public, and, and it's been written up a lot. At the end of the day, the final transaction value was about $250 million. So That's our investors that put money into that 1.8 round did very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say. I would say. I wish I knew you then. I would have been happy to be in the... Uh, so September Don't worry, we, we have a glorified list of people that said, no, you're an idiot. So, <laughs> so they're, they're some of my closest friends. So, so it's September 2008. You're in this company. You've done your earn out. And now you're saying to yourself, um, maybe I should stay or should I take a break? Should I go on vacation? No, you don't. You, what happens next? I mean, I mean, I actually did want to go on vacation. Um, How long do you go on vacation for? I think my wife and I went on a 16-day trip to seven countries. Awesome. So, so that, that, speaks to, that speaks to how aligned we are in our ADD level. Um, we had planned on going for six months. So, so that, that's actually what we did. I have a, a good friend of mine who, after he went public, he went um, in the late 90s, and he, he got married, and he said he planned this trip exactly like this, like a new place every two days. And he got to the third place, and he said, I learned a lot about my wife. We stayed there the rest of the trip. <laughs> um, he said, the ADD of entrepreneurs is not always contagious. So. Yep. No, we, um, we, we, had a fun, we had a fun but yet crazy experience, which I'm sure we'll never repeat. <laughs> so you get done, and, and you decide to be an entrepreneur again. You're like, all right, here we go. So what? talk about that idea, where that idea came from. I know that company still exists, yeah. Pangea Properties. But why? You didn't stay in fintech. You went a different direction. How come? 
at the time, I wasn't really looking to do anything in fintech. I wanted to do something, but I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I felt like we had done a good job in fintech. I wanted to try to try our hand at something else. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, I mean, if you guys remember 2008, the world kind of exploded. And we had the financial crisis led by real estate, led by residential real estate. And there was no capital anywhere. We were just lucky enough to have made a lot of money for investors uh, just at that time. And what happened was we saw this huge distress in real estate. And what we learned in the fire business, anytime you have this crazy correction or some sort of dislocation in the market, there has to be opportunity. And so at the time, we weren't really looking to build a sustainable company. We were looking to invest in real estate the same way I wanted to do when I was an investment maker. Mm -hmm. Right, because you had looked at it before. That's right. I, now I get the connection. So you go to this, this one and... and um what did you bring to real estate then? Like, what was your edge or your angle besides the market opportunity? Were there anything um, else that you looked at to say, how do we, how do we out, out, outperform the market? I would say initially, kind of like, you know, but we didn't really know exactly what the final end product would look like. We saw an opportunity to build a nice little sustainable business by providing great housing opportunities for people. Fairly quickly, we figured out that if we could solve the institutional gap and in be able to invest in sub-100 unit apartment properties, which are sub-scale institutional investors can't invest in those, but they make up 80% of the unit stock. And again, once we started doing more research, we figured out then we could actually build something really interesting. And if we used the technology and analytics and operational capability we had used at Enova to do that, then it could be sustainable. And did you, um, sounds like you brought a level of sophistication to it like you had in Innova, what were what was what kind of sophistication did this business bring, and how is that different than the different than the capital that's chasing the larger side of the market? Yeah, so most of the capital, ninety nine percent of the capital, flows in the apartment category. Obviously, in every category is different, but in apartments, flows into those larger unit unit categories, and the management is all done centralized. Mm -hmm. So you have management at the property, at the physical location, whether it's a down, downtown high rise or a suburban ground up you know, or, or a, suburb, a suburban three-store walk-up 300-unit apartment property, nobody had figured out how to actually manage lots of small buildings that are scattered site. And so what we really tried to do is figure out how to do that effectively. And what was the secret? What, how'd you crack the code on that one? And we, 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 we are still working on it, quite honestly, but I think what we figured out is if we could get substantial scale in, uh, in proximity to each other and then have a centralized technology platform uh, that allowed managers to span properties and a centralized operating center that was able to take calls and route them correctly, cent centralized workflow and ticketing systems, then you could start to make management really efficient. And so that's what we have to do. And then centralized underwriting, borrowing from what we learned how to do at Enova, is figuring out who is a good credit, who is a person we should lend to or rent to, who is a bad credit, the person that we should not rent an apartment to. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it actually turned out to be very similar in a lot of ways. So in, in more ways than one, because you got a chance to your physical rollout. So how was it scaling in the physical world versus the internet world? Yeah, it's a lot more challenging. No question about it. In the, in the internet different world. Different than you expected? Yeah, I think it's, it's very different. The internet um, lulls you in, into a little bit of a sense of confidence where if you have a great idea, you can go and you can build it and roll it out virtually immediately, and it goes out. In a brick and mortar world, you just can't do that. You have to train people and process and quality assurance. And I think that's, that's the part that's hard to change. Mm -hmm. Things don't move that fast. And for this deal, Pangea Properties, how much money did you raise? So initially, we raised about $55 million. Uh, we put in our own capital and, and went out to existing investors. And that was the whole play. But since then, we've raised about a total of about $200 million. Wow. So um, I see a pattern as I go through my notes. It, it's like presidential elections every four years, leap years every four years, else companies appear to be every four years. So we go from 2008 to 2012, and like clockwork, um, something else happens. Tell us about, um, I know that Pangea is still around and, and doing well. Pangea is doing great. My business partner, who happens to be former Inova, you know, surprise, surprise, he was one of my closest friends in high school and college was the COO of Enova and actually built all of the operations at Pangea, which is, to me, the really hard part. He, he was really in a position to step up and run the business 
on a full-time basis, and I was starting to look around what to do next. And lo and behold, my two co-founders at Avant, I think at least one of them is here today, were former Enova interns that went out to the West Coast. Let's and were give part Paul a shout-out. Where is he? There. Yeah, we're, yeah, there's Paul. All right, Paul. Yeah, Paul runs technology for Avant. He's our CTO. So, so Paul and John were the two bright stars at Enova. Paul was on the technology side as an intern and then you know, came back full time and really became a rock star at a very early age. And, uh, and John, who's our other co-founder, was his counterpart on the data and analytics side. And actually, when he was 25 years old, was running the 25-person PhD team at Enova. And they, they decided that they had enough of corporate life at the tender age of 24, 25, and got into Y Combinator, which... Yeah, so talk about this, because this is interesting, because you joined these guys after Y Combinator. Yep. So talk about how the, the genesis of that. How did that come about? Yeah, so, so John and Paul were, I, I think, in the, probably the 2011 class of YC, and uh, they had a great business, but to their credit, I think they fairly quickly realized that the economic model of the business just didn't quite work. And so they were looking to figure out what to do next. And is the economic model doesn't work because in subprime you need scale? No, so they, they were doing something completely different. They were trying to build mint.com for subprime. Got it. They, and, and they just kind of figured out that it was hard to get consumers to pay for that service. So either you had to go really big and get advertising dollars or sell to Intuit, and ideally both. And that's kind of already been done by Mint. Mm -hmm. So they were looking to figure out how to pivot. And... Uh, for a long time, you know, this, this whole trend that we saw with Enova, which is banks pulling back from providing small dollar loans to consumers, had only accelerated with massive regulation. All the banks got hurt through the financial crisis. We had spent a lot of time thinking about it, looking about it, looking at it. There was this huge opportunity to come in and take the place that banks once served. And that's where Avant was born. We just kind of agreed that, look, we'll take the business that you'd built, which actually has a lot of things that we can leverage to launch faster, will kind of change the scope of the business, equitize some of your existing investors, make sure that they're happy, but really build something really, really big and exciting in fintech. And it's a little like the, it, Capital One built a really big business in a not dissimilar space. Different, but not dissimilar. When I first, you and I first sat down, you said, think of Avon as Capital Two on the internet. Talk about um, a little bit the idea, because this is a big idea. Um, why so big? What can this be? And, and, and you know, um, where the idea really came from? So, so we're actually fortunate enough to have one of the two co-founders of Capital One as one of our investors. So, so he's given me the right to use that Capital Two phrase. But it, I, I think it's great homage to what Capital One accomplished oh, yeah. over a very long period of time. They built an amazing business really focusing on using data and analytics to serve middle-class consumers around the world. And that's what we're trying to emulate. Avant's mission is really, really simple. We have very quickly become the leading online lending marketplace platform providing credit solutions to middle-class consumers. And that's what we're trying to, trying to build. And we think if we can accomplish that goal globally, we could just build a massive business because the universe is gigantic. Yep. The market is massive. So I was in... Uh San Francisco a few weeks back, and uh, uh, I met the guy from Prosper. Okay, Ron uh, Suber? Yeah, Ron Suber. Yeah, former Chicago guy. Had nice things to say about you. Yeah, no, Ron's a great guy. Say hello. Um, and, uh, but talk a little bit, you know, you see Lending Club, you see Prosper. You're competing very differently. Tell me about how you see the market and, and why you like where you are. So in a lot of ways, we are actually competing with Lending Club and Prosper, but their focus on the consumer side is, one, to a customer that's up market. The average consumer at Lending Club or Prosper makes about $100,000 a year, has a credit score that's about 710 or higher, which is a customer that banks actually do want to provide credit to. So they're competing with banks? They are competing with banks. And we are also providing credit to that customer, but our average consumer has about a 650 or 660 credit score, which is right at the average, and is making between kind of forty dollars to $100,000 a year, but really on average about sixty which makes up about 50% of consumers in this country. So we believe we have a much broader category. We don't charge upfront fees to the consumer. Lending Club and Prosper do, because that's just their model. And then we also take risk, which means that we not only originate loans, and, uh, and I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Lending Club or Prosper. Lending Club is now a public company. Take risk 
and sell it to investors, we also hold risk, which means we have skin in the game, mm. which is, I think, a Why did you make that decision? Because you've raised a lot more capital because of that. You're really a finance company. We, we're, we're a financial technology company, so we're, we're really a technology company which is providing a financial product. But you're actually underwriting the risk. No question. I think, well, for one... Yeah, what, what drew you to that? Why? Well, for one, pe people lose sight of the fact that Lending Club and Prosper are 10-year-old companies. For eight years, they could never scale because they didn't have any data and they weren't willing to take their own risk. We said, we don't want to wait 10 years. We're willing to take our own risk. Yeah. And once we get data, then we'll find investors that want to be part of our marketplace. And that's where we are Interesting. Today. Well, that's... Uh, so talk about, you know, we... It's an interesting conversation we have amongst founders, which is, you know, in a perfect world, the joke is in Silicon Valley, but like any company that um, doesn't have people in it, like you don't have to hire people except for engineers, you know. That's why Eric Olafkowski and Brad Keywell have been um, so successful in looking at the business differently, which is they scale sales forces, they scale account management, um, you know, the messy problem of, of actually having to roll out people instead of just bits. Talk a little bit about... Um, the decision to raise capital to be a, a finance company and a technology company. And, you know, it, it clearly helps you go faster, but there are some great examples of that out there. What's, what's your view on, you know, you're almost full stack. So talk about that as a strategy for, for trying to do something as big as you're doing versus, versus the more conventional don't take any of that because it's kind of a little messy. You got to raise more capital. You got to do a lot of compliance. Yeah. So Avant's vision from day one was big. To our vision today is much, much bigger. We're trying to build internally. We talk about it like hush, hush. We're trying to build what we think is a hundred billion dollar company wow. in a trillion dollar market. And in order to get there, I think the only way to to do that over a long period of time is being vertically integrated and being a platform, which means that you don't only have one product is that you have multiple products, and you're able to serve that consumer up and down spectrum. And are you a closed platform, and they're all Avant pr products? Uh, so they're all Avant products, but we have institutional investors today that are able to buy loans off of our platform. I see. Yeah, so we are a marketplace, but the products themselves are And you are syndicate all as well? We originate and service on behalf of investors. Got it. Interesting. So do, was that from the beginning you always wanted to do that, or did that evolve? No, that, that's definitely been from the beginning. We always believed that at some point we would have interest from investors. It just took a while. Uh, it took a couple of years to get to the point where we had enough data that got investors comfortable. I love the fact that for Al, he's like, it took a couple of years to raise a billion plus dollars. I mean, you know, you have a different level of impatience than most, which I appreciate. Um, so this is, this is really interesting to me. So you go ahead and you have this big vision, huge vision, which you've now really taken. But how do you raise the early money? Because if you're the early money in this, you know, it's dropping the bucket early on. You know, the, the kind of money we talk about in A and B rounds here is nothing compared to what it would take to finance your vision. Um, talk about the raising of money. Talk about the reception you had. Obviously, you've been very successful, so that had to be appealing to people. But at the same time, you weren't selling something that was lean. Mm -hmm. You were selling something that was, you know, big and, you know, this is an incredible Hulk of startup. <laughs> Big and bulky. Yeah. Um, well, I think we were very lucky in a, in a number of respects. One is Lending Club had been successful. Google had just invested in Lending Club. The space had gotten hot after not being very hot for a long time. Nobody really cared about online lending up until about 2012, maybe 2013. And so we got the benefit of Lending Club evangelizing the whole category. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, um, like everything, Relationship means everything, and your credibility means everything. And August Capital, who uh, has been our lead investor for our, uh, they led our first two rounds, but it has invested over $80 million in the company. The How big are their funds? Uh, about five to $600 million. That's so a lot of money for them. It's the biggest check they've ever written by a factor of two. So they, they, they. And August Capital is famous, I think, for doing Microsoft. Yeah, they, the Dave Marcourt was the sole VC in Microsoft. And the tie-in is that Dave Marcourt was a personal investor in Pangea. Oh, really? So that's, that's the real tie-in. Huh. So we had known them for a long time. We actually tried to get August Capital to invest in Pangea as a, as a fund. And they basically said, we love you, but you're not really a tech company, so go, go and find your money elsewhere. But we built the relationship. And so when we went back to August Capital with nothing more than a uh, two-page business plan, 
on a paper napkin. They, they wanted in. You know, they, they said, we believe in you, and we want to be there with you, and we're going to support you. And initially, they only put in $5 million, and since then, they've put in a total of 85 or so. So talk a little bit about product market fit on Avant. What was that experience like? How would you figure it out? Obviously, you had a sense of the market, but how did you, how'd you, how'd you nail that? So the premise for Avant for, from day one was we were going to be able to use more advanced data and analytics than even Innova had done and use that to provide better products at lower rates to consumers. Because the challenge was our cost of capital was high. Banks' cost of capital is virtually zero. The only way to bridge that difference was going to be through much better data. And so we spent a lot of time early investing in data and how to actually underwrite consumers using more advanced technology. What that's allowed us to do is actually compete with banks directly in terms of providing better products. Hmm. And so... So you're lower cost, you have a lower cost structure. We have right? substantially better operating margins and uh, our cost of capital is still substantially more expensive even though that, that gap is narrowing. But we're just substantially better at figuring out who's a good credit and who's a bad credit. And if we can break those into two. That's no small feat. I mean, these banks are big and sophisticated. That's impressive. Definitely. And, uh, but they also are the subject of legacy infrastructure and legacy systems. And the technology, which I think we're all talking about, and big data and machine learning are probably two of the most overused and I would say misused terms in mm -hmm. all of venture, actually applying the techniques correctly yields amazing results. And I would say in all verticals. And that's what we're trying to do. So I want to come back to that in a minute, but but I want to go back to something earlier. So you saw the need, you know, you talked when we got together before, you talked a little bit about you knew the space, but credit cards had dropped by $150 billion in what they were willing to underwrite. So there was clearly a need. But this was a crowded general space in terms of acquiring user customers. Well, a lot of, you know, there was, there was um, Lending Tree and there's other people out at Credit Karma. There's a lot of noise in that space. So how'd you get the early acquisition of you customers? So... Lending Tree and Credit Karma are interesting because they're actually both marketing companies and platforms and great partners of ours. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we, we're, we have great partnerships with both. So today the space is getting very crowded, but I, I would say it's getting crowded, again, focusing on lending to people that have options. The people that we're trying to lend to are people that really don't have great options. And that space is not that crowded because it's very challenging to provide good credit products to those consumers. It's interesting. One of the ways the first Chicago got in trouble early on was they made their strategy about um, lending to multinationals right at the time that loans became securitized. So these people could go to Wall Street and sell it. And it was a tough strategy. But seeing how it's trend, you've done a great job identifying, identifying that. One of the things you also said was that, um, you know, I, I've heard you say this before, you know, that competitors in this space have been greedy or you know, not necessarily always been as scrupulous as they should be. Um, you know, how did you see the, um, the competitive landscape, not just from the macro trend, which you clearly spotted incredibly well again, three times in a row, you're very good at that, but how did you see the fact that like, the people here are ripe for being disrupted because they're either not doing the right things for the customer or they're doing the wrong thing for the customer. How'd you identify that? And do you see that as something that entrepreneurs should be looking for? Yeah, so I'm a big fan in dislocation. Um, Peter Thiel just wrote zero to one, which I, I think is great in that it's so simple and just focuses on the concept of how do you create unfair competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. And that's really what we try to look for is how can we create an unfair competitive advantage that is sustainable and then use technology and analytics to build that advantage over time. Mm -hmm. I, I think. Banks aren't necessarily unscrupulous. I, I just think at this point they're focused on you know, regulators. The regulators are running the banks and the banks are utilities. So even if they wanted to innovate, they really just can't. Mm -hmm. And so I think dislocations in markets create opportunities to, to generate that competitive advantage. So talk about how much money of capital have you raised total equity and debt? So we've raised 334 million of equity capital uh, in four rounds. And uh, on top of that, about a billion five of a combination of debt on our own balance sheet and institutional investor demand to buy loans. So that's incredible. Um, what is it, you know, talk about that experience um, of raising that kind of capital. What were the, what were this, you know, you talked about going to August on a napkin. That's a great story, but has it been smooth sailing all the way or has it 
come in fits and starts. I mean, this isn't. A, I mean, I don't know anybody else has raised as much capital as you have. Well, we're we're good for better or for worse at giving away our company to people, uh, <laughs> or or large chunks of it thereof. But um, you know, we've been very lucky and very fortuitous. We have great investors, and all we're trying to do when we talk to investors is if we're talking equity investors, is really try to sell them on our vision, is that we're trying to build a really big company. And not everyone believes it. And some people that believe it don't believe that we can execute. So your initial funding was from August? August Capital. And then talk about your next round. What'd you raise? How'd, how'd you raise it? What was the, what were you up against? Was it easy, hard? So on top of, up top of August Capital, Victory Park Capital, which is a local investment management firm, uh, and people who, again, I'd known before, so it was very relationship driven were very active in this fintech universe. They invested equity dollars and also provided our first credit facility, which the capital that's been more challenging than equity has actually been the debt. Because on the equity side, I think we have a great growth profile, massive market opportunity, and investors are more willing to take a risk. The challenging capital was that billion five of debt capacity. Because the reality is we have no data, or, or we had no data two years ago. Now we have two years of data, but people on the debt side are looking at 10 years of data. Mm -hmm. So the biggest challenge we have is really trying to make sure that the story we tell is accurate, as compelling as possible, and balances the lack of data with you know, the, right, the right snapshots that we can show. So the, the equity story has been, you know, we've been very lucky to be in a space that's hot, to be there early, and thankfully we started our company almost three years ago and not today, because I think today it would be very challenging in this category. But the debt side, we continue to fight through. Our goal calls for $10 billion of capital to fund loans over the next three years. So that's, that's the hard problem. Incredible. So I um, want to go and just uh, one more question, then I'll go to the questions from the audience here. Uh, you know, you are in an interesting position. Um, you have this big vision to be a $100 billion company. You know, what can you say about your traction today and what can you say about, you know, we're sitting here in five, ten years, what that looks like? I think you're in the, you said you're in the U.S. and the U.K. today? We are in the U.S. and the U.K. We're clearly the leading platform for middle-class consumer finance in both markets. Really? Uh, and it, it, like I said, people aren't focused on it. And so, scale-wise, in the month of June, we originated nearly $200 million of loans and 25,000 loans. So, uh, Lending Club, which is a huge company has originated about 30,000 loans. So we haven't quite caught Lending Club yet. But um, they've been around a little longer. They've been around a little bit longer. But uh, you know, we, we, we've had a lot of scale. We originated about a billion foreign loans. We got to a billion dollars faster than any company, um, maybe outside of China, you know, where we don't, we, we, we don't know, like unclear all the data there. But uh, th there, if you believe it, there are over 100, actually I take it back, over 500 P2P, online lending, person-to-person -person lending companies in China. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I think there's something like 50 to 100 failing every quarter, another 50 to 100. Well, they're so. very drawn to that. I was talking to a guy who said, you know, in China, when they want to buy a car, the na people in the neighborhood get together and say, let's all, let's get 50 people together, we'll go see the car dealers, and we'll say, we either buy from one of you, give us your best deal, and they go negotiate as a yeah. uh, consortium. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting market, um, yeah. but a challenging one, I would say. So, so let me ask you, um, you know, I, that, it was a great question here to start, but I have to ask you the question that I couldn't help but jot down, which is, so I think judging from there, like 116 Republican presidential nominees or candidates for the nomination, um, it seems to me that there must be a presidential election coming up, which also means that four years from the votes coming on, um, you know, is this the next four years? Is this the next, like, is these... Is this what you're going to, do you think this is where you, where you continue to go? I, honestly, I just feel like Avant is in a unique position because there are very few companies that can really espouse to that $100 billion company level. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do. And, and it's not, it's just an ambition. If we get there, who knows? As, as long as we're willing to give it the honest try. So for me, I'm, I'm all in. I, awesome. I think there are very few opportunities that can be that large and that transformative. Yeah, for sure. And so, well, it's exciting already to be the leading lender to the middle class in the U.S., and I mean, that's incredible in the U.K. Um, so the first question that we have here is um, a hypothetical. I want to see if it was actually a real question before I got here. A hypothetical. If you weren't running Avant, what business would you want to start? Um, 
So in opening the act, uh, swipe sense. <laughs> By the way, I'd never heard of swipe sense before. I think I think healthcare is super exciting. I just all parts of healthcare. You didn't say that. You said if I weren't doing this, I'd be in healthcare. That's interesting. Yeah, no, no question about it. To me, financial services, healthcare, education, they're massive. Collectively, they make up 70 or 75 percent of the U.S. economy, and they're totally screwed up in a whole bunch of different ways. Just, I think the challenge is always. I don't know anything about healthcare and little about education. I think it's understanding the entry points of how to actually get in. So, I, something in healthcare to me is really interesting. And what have you learned over your time about um, looking for that beachhead or that entry point? What, what, you know, what would your general advice be for somebody looking for the right idea? What have you learned about seeking out that beachhead, that that uh, entry point? I, I would say you don't, you shouldn't have to theorize too too deep. The, it's, it usually is on the surface. If you can find big markets that are fundamentally broken, and figure out a path to actually fix them. And, and, it, and it doesn't have to be a 100x change, but it has to be about a 10x change. Then you can create that competitive advantage. So to me, it's hard to tell. I think you have to dig really deep and figure out exactly kind of the right way to enter. But there's so many things that are broken. I mean, dislocation creates opportunity. So clearly, we have the healthcare system being turned upside down. I think there are massive opportunity all over the place there. So. Uh, this is an interesting one. One of the questions I ask is, is the top ranked remaining uh, the remaining questions, and that is, which I always love, um, if you had to do one thing, to get something that you've learned or done, say, oh, boy, I would always do this again, what is it in starting a company or building a company? Well, I, th I think Avant, we, we get to benefit greatly from the fact that virtually our entire management team are people that have worked for me in the past or I've known for 10 years. It's, it's unreal the cohesiveness in which we can operate and how quickly we can move. I think it's all about the team. You know, if you could have a decent idea and a really good team, you can accomplish almost anything. So what's one thing you'd never do again or boy, a hard learned lesson that you're like tattooed in my mind? I, I, I think it's specific to the situation, but I've been short-sighted a bunch of times in, in my history and it's always come back to bite and it's it just basically means making decisions that you know are not good decisions but you make them anyway mm -hmm. and uh, and it, it could span it's building offshore technology teams to save 20% cost when you know it's going to burn you know 100% cost in productivity it's uh, building a product in the short term that you know is just not the right product it's hiring the wrong person because you need to fill a hole it could be just, just making those decisions you know are the wrong decisions. So um, a couple of, couple of questions here that are interesting. Um, people curious about, as a, as a multiple-time entrepreneur, you know, are there companies that you're really excited about that you're, not in, that you're not a member of? Besides the ones you've started, what are the companies that when you look at them, you go, that's really exciting. I, I love that, but you get excited about seeing here or other places. Yeah, I, I, I would say... The things um, that are able to just scale exponentially are, are super exciting. And, and you have some companies like that in Chicago now, which are so exciting. You know, K-Cure, Ray's, Context Media. Globally, it's Uber, Airbnb, um, Palantir, which not a lot of people talk about, but I think Palantir is an amazing company. So these things that are able to just get to the next level because they're global, they're solving real problems, that's what we're trying to emulate. Exciting. Um, people have a question about, do you think we're in a bubble? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think there are select instances where things don't make sense, but if you really dig deep, investors are making bets, and usually on the venture side, as, as we talk about, all these deals have structure, and so the investors are protected if things go badly. Um, I don't think we're in a bubble. I think companies, by and large, are solving real problems, and it's not that easy to raise money. Uh, I do try to do it pretty much all the time, and, and it's still challenging. So I, I, I don't think, I wasn't there in 99 and 2000 on that side, but I don't think we're close. Do you, do you look at a company like yours and say a public market would be a better path to raise money, or do you think private markets can support what you do for an extended period? I think eventually we will be a public company uh, just because of capital and visibility, but we'd like to stay private as long as we can. We're just so early. We're only two and a half years in. 
And uh, despite the four year, you know, my four year history, I think this is a 20 year opportunity. So we'd like to, we'd like to develop more of that opportunity internally. People are curious about, do you have a point of view on Bitcoin and how Bitcoin fits in all of what, you know, FinTech and what you're doing and the like? I think the venture people we talked to uh, used to talk a lot about Bitcoin and right now they're talking about blockchain. I feel like Bitcoin is a little bit, uh, has lost some of its luster. The blockchain I think is interesting, but I don't know how you make money on it. I don't know how you invest in it. The Fortune Conference, uh, uh, Dan Primick asked the question of how many on, how many venture guys, 50 in the room or whatever, are investing in Bitcoin and nobody raised their hand. Um, Fred Wilson, who's a big Bitcoin person, as you know, basically said that's where you invest. But I do agree, the blockchain is so much broader and it's, it's yeah. you know, it takes advantage of the unique, unique ability. Um, you had to start focusing on regulatory. Talk about being an entrepreneur in a regulatory, a regulated industry. Are there pros? Are there how do you see the cons? Um, I I actually like when when does it become a big problem or a big challenge? I I personally believe that uh, barriers to entry are core to that sustainable competitive advantage, and regulation can be a barrier to entry. And if you're able to build processes and systems to deal with it, then you have a leg up on other people that would potentially enter. My my wife, who happens to be in the room. Uh, built all of our compliance and regulatory environments. We actually work together. So Anna has been our general counsel and chief compliance officer since inception. She runs a medium-sized law firm uh, as part of Avant. She's got 40 people or so underneath oh her. Oh, my goodness. Wow. It, we, we're in a super heavily regulated industry. We take it extremely seriously. And our view on it is it's a cost of doing business. And so, you know, we just want to make sure that our products comply to the sense and the word and the letter of the law but at the same time are consumer friendly and that sometimes they're not aligned. So we, we just need to, to work really hard to make sure that we can create alignment. Um, if you look at, uh, as an entrepreneur, is there any books that you really enjoy that you feel like, boy, if I wanted, if I were a young entrepreneur or a young person interested in this, what am I, what would you recommend for them to read, to, to learn, so, pick up some of the wisdom that you find helpful yourself? Uh, it, it's actually a fun question. I'm smiling about it because, uh, my, a lot of our guys will make fun of me because whichever book I read recently is the one that I keep sending them quotes about. So most, re most recently I, I read the Ben Horowitz book, which you know, I probably should have read years ago, but this, the hard things about hard things. I, 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 I love real stories, not, not generic ideas, but the fact that he really tells his story. And I think we, we collectively as entrepreneurs, we forget the tough times and it always looks prettier from the outside than it does from the inside. And he, kind of tells it like it is. I think, you know, I, I recently read the, Starwood, uh, the Starbucks book, Howard Schultz's book, uh, which pour your heart into it, which is also pretty old. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it's a great book. Um, the Everything Store, it, it, to me the stories that actually try to think about the challenges as opposed to just the easy stuff, I think that's interesting. What's your, um, what's your thought on, you've been an entrepreneur here since 2000 and, uh, Four, um, although you're originally a Kenosha entrepreneur. <laughs> um, but you've been doing this since 2004. Um, how do you see Chicago for startups today? Oh, it's awesome. I, I mean, look, look, let's look around. I, I mean, I think this is a testament to, testament to you doing this and spending your time doing this. Just a testament to J.B. Pritzker and Kevin Willer and Stuart Larkins and everyone else that's dedicating their time, Mark Tebby, and that's trying to make Chicago viral and vibrant. Maybe the only thing we still need to do is, is have more wins. And uh, I think wins like, like Amazon and Microsoft to really create virality. Yep. But I love it. It's so exciting. The fact that people are interested in startups, that you guys are all coming out to events like this. I mean, it, that, that to me is invigorating. Well, you're building one of the great ones. I, I look forward to seeing how it unfolds. What a great story. Thanks for sharing it. No, thank you for spending the time.